My name is uh, Keith Su. I'm a Sir Henry Welcome Postdoctoral Fellow at University College London in the Department of Renal Medicine uh, based at the Royal Free Hospital. Our, our lab group looks at um, a lot of rare disease patients who have uh, renal tubular disorders, uh, a lot of which have impacts on blood pressure. And so we study these rare monogenic syndromes of blood pressure to understand how the process is regulated and then to look for novel antihypertensive targets. And in particular, I'm going to talk about a part of the kidney called the distal convoluted tubule, uh, which is the focus of action for some of the stuff we look at. So just to kind of brush up on some of the, the basic physiology, the, the kidney is um, the primary organ for filtering the blood. It takes about 20% of uh, each heartbeat. That equates to 180 litres of blood a day. It's done in functional units of the nephron, of which there are about a million per kidney. Uh, blood is filtered into the... Um, the uh, glomerulus and filtered into the tubules where sodium is reabsorbed with about 99% efficiency and we target these clinically using diuretics to promote salt wasting and uh, excretion of water to lower blood pressure. The distal convoluted tubule is an aldosterone sensitive portion of the kidney. Uh, it tightly controls um, and fine tunes the amount of sodium being excreted. And it did, one of the main culprits in this is a sodium chloride co-transporter, or NCC, which imports in a sodium and a chloride in an electroneutral fashion. And in the last two decades, there's been intense study of how this pathway is regulated. And it's done by WINCs, which are rich with no lysine kinases, which can sense chloride and transduce extracellular potassium signals. They act via a middleman SPAC, which is phosphorylated and phosphorylates NCC to promote its uh, activity and stabilization of the membrane, uh, increasing sodium reabsorption. And we traditionally um, counteract their actions using chiazide uh, diuretics to um, promote diuresis and lower blood pressure. So what's the genetic information that we have and, and the disease information show that NCC is really important in blood pressure control? Well, as I mentioned before, these monogenic syndromes, one of the very rare ones, Gordon syndrome, uh, or familial hypertension hyperkalemia was discovered um, in the mid 2000s to be as a result of mutations in these with no lysine kinases, WINC1 and WINC4. These patients have uh, increased uh, salt retention, uh, hyperkalemia, and hypertension. And unusually, there's a, 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 um, another monogenic syndrome which is slightly more common but still rare, which is called Gittleman syndrome, which results from mutations uh, in the actual sodium chloride chloride co-transporter itself. And these have the exact mirror image uh, opposite phenotype. So they have salt wasting, hypokalemia, uh, hypotension, and for every other phenotype you look at like bone mineral density, um, calcium handling, etc. <clears throat> when we mimic these mutations in animal models, we can see that uh, mutations in the wink uh, increase salt loading and NCC activity uh, in the animals, leading to hypertension. So we have an increase in the total amount of NCC and then it's activated form, which is the phosphorylated form of phospho-NCC. When we make mutations in SPAC to mimic uh, those in Gittleman syndrome, this is a SPAC that cannot be activated by WINC. We see salt wasting, loss of so, uh, salt retention and uh, hypotension. And as you can see from radiotelemetry data here in live wake animal during the night and day cycle, it's about a 20 millimeter mercury uh, difference in blood pressure. So what we wanted to do is look at the most severe form of Gordon syndrome. Two new, two new genes were discovered to be involved in Gordon syndrome, Cullen-3 and klh 3 which form a, a ubiquitin ring ligase. Patients with Cullen-3 have dominant mutations, they're all heterozygous. And uh, it results, uh, they're, they're all as a result of deletion of a single exon um, in, in the middle of the protein. And uh, they have very early onset uh, hypertension, often manifesting in early teen years. They have severe hyperkalemia, um, and uh, research has revealed that the way in which the Cullen pathway is involved is by actually regulating wink abundance levels. So the higher the amount of winks, the higher the amount of NC activity. Cullen uh, forms a complex with its adapter protein KLH3 uh, to uh, recruit winks and cause their ubiquitination uh, and send them for a degradation. Um, Though, why is this disease the most severe one? Well, it affects the different winks, wink one and wink four. So you could imagine compounding things, but there's evidence that colon three and winks have a role in the vasculature. So knockout of SPAC, uh, which is the downstream effector of wink, uh, 
and NKCC1 show a uh, decreased vascular contractility. Uh, it has been shown that um, heterozygous animals for WINK1 knockouts um, have decreased response to alpha adrenergic stimulation. And then uh, angiotensin 2 can activate uh, the vasculature via WINK3. And then uh, dominant mutations in PPAR gamma, which are known to cause metabolic syndrome and hypertension, show a decrease in colon 3 activity. So we hypothesize that these patients don't just have a renal phenotype, but also a vascular phenotype as well. So we sought to investigate this more. So the first bit, I won't go into too much detail of this, is what does the actual deletion do? Well, it removes a rigid part of the protein, causing it to be quite flexible. And in short, using some NMR and mass spec data, you can see that normally you would vicunate a few sites on um, its target and on itself. And then when you actually uh, increase the flexibility, it hyper ubiquitates itself, targeting itself for degradation. So when you look at light states from the actual kidneys of these animals, there's a loss in, in the total amount of colon 3. And that leads to a decrease in the inhibition of winks and ubiquitination, causing their accumulation. That increases the downstream signal to SPAC, increasing its phosphorylation. And that ultimately leads to an increase in phosphorylation of NC effectivity. And that stabilizes the amount of it at the membrane. You can even see this when you look at the actual images. Um, here you can see wing 4 in green and then NCC, where there's massive accumulations of these proteins within the distal convoluted tubules themselves, forming these punctate structures, where, which are an indicator of activity. But I'm just going to go into the experimental stuff. So this is the kind of setup that I would be using. I would have in an animal here uh, the right carotid artery uh, cannulated. Um, I actually swapped to using solid state catheters from Miller instead of fluid fills for the better frequency response. I would have lead to uh, ECG going and I'd have a rectal probe and I would cannulate the, the jugular artery to, to administer uh, drugs. And I'm just going to swap over to, to um, show you what some of that data looks like. Can you see the lab chart on screen? Uh, hopefully. So this is a, this is a whole trace. Um, over a two-hour experiment under uh, terminal anesthesia, uh, where we've done a stabilization period for baseline measurements, and then we have done phenylephrine administration, washout, and then angiotensin II administration. So in here, you're going to get <coughs> your full uh, traces of your blood pressure in red, ECG in blue, and uh, body temperature in green. I would then normally have um, a, a couple of calculated things on the go at the same time. Um, reset channel height. So I would actually have additional calculations done. So if you can see here on this column, I'd have systolic, diastolic, and mean arterial pressure calculated in real time from the blood pressure data, as well as the heart rate calculated from ECG, from R, to, from R peak to R peak. And then I would also have another, um, this purple line down the end, another calculation, which is the um, first derivative or the velocity on the upstroke of the blood pressure, um, which gives me an indication of the inotropy or how um, strongly the heart is contracting. Um, one thing that is not often investigated is um, the pulse waveform of the blood pressure, so the actual shape of it. So I'll get into that in one second, but I'll just show you some of the data that we have from um, the animal. So these colon 3 animals have uh, hypertension, and they have, uh, which would be expected. So it, it does mimic the human disease, where we see an increase in systolic blood pressure, uh, higher relative to diastolic. And we do see a decrease in the heart rate. That uh, made us think about looking at potential cardiac dysfunction in these animals as well. So using a um, lab chart, we were able to pull out some of the ECG parameters and look at uh, electrophysiology changes. So we find that these animals have a, a decrease in their dromotropic effect, their um, chromo uh, chromotropic effect as well. Uh, they, have, they have a decrease in the heart rate uh, and it just looks like there's general conductance issues in them. So this is something that we're currently investigating further. To talk about that pulse waveform that I mentioned before, <clears throat> for those of you who aren't familiar, when blood pressure leaves the heart, it's a wave function of pressure that has going to have a forward wave that leaves via the aortic valve down the vascular tree. As it then reaches the uh, peripheral uh, resistance vessels, that waveform is then reflected back up. And when those two waves in, um, meet each other, they're going to form an interference pattern, which is what you actually measure 
in the black line as the pulse wave uh, waveform. So you actually can get amplification of the blood pressure due to interference of these waveforms. And as you age, your arteries become less compliant and more stiff, and this can lead to, even with a normal blood pressure, increased risks of stroke, um, heart uh, failure, uh, and organ damage. Uh, so it's an independent risk factor that um, is, is not often investigated. Uh, and where you actually measure this in the arterial tree is important, um, because the further you go into the peripheral uh, blood vessels, um, you will get different diastolic, systolic uh, blood pressures and different wave reflectance patterns uh, that cause different amplification. Um, we used in this experiment two different metrics. One was augmentation index. And um, so just to go back here, the way we you look for stiffening in arteries, the gold standard is called pulse wave velocity. So the stiffer the artery, the faster the waves travel. So they, they'll go down and bounce back further and then amplify. So, so if you can't do pulse wave velocity, it requires a special setup with them, um, two catheters usually, or a single catheter with two pressure point uh, measurement uh, points. Uh, you can use augmentation index, which is a, is, is an, a, a proxy for um, arterial stiffness. So here you measure from the anachronic notch, which is where these waveforms are um, interfering with one another at the first instance, to the peak of the systolic blood pressure. To approximate the um, position of the anachronic notch, we can use lab charts to do a, a calculation um, of the fourth derivative of the blood pressure. So this produces this waveform here, you can see in white. And if I just zoom in a bit for us, um, on one of the waveforms, if we zoom out once more. Uh, as this is going through, it passes the zero point, you can see going negative here once, twice, and then a third time. So once the value reaches an, 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 near the zero value, that will actually match up with the anachronic notch. So we can measure from here to the peak of the blood pressure, and this will give us our augmentation pressure. So the difference between anachronic notch to the maxima is our augmentation pressure, and then we measure that as a fraction of uh, diastolic to systolic blood pressure, which is our, P, uh, our pulse pressure. Um, to get a fraction. The other value that we calculate is um, diastolic decay. So this can be used to approximate the diastolic time decay constant as the blood vest, as the blood is emptying from the aorta, the more vascular resistance you have, the slower it will empty and that will change the slope. Low vascular resistance would have quicker emptying. So this time decay constant can be used to infer uh, the total peripheral resistance within, within a, a whole system. So to calculate that, uh, we're using in lab chart um, two different calculations. Um, so let me just remove these, show what we're doing here. So I will be adding on here a, another calculation for um, the uh, second derivative of the blood pressure. And that will give me Order 11. Right. Um, and where this is a peak, that will give me my dichronic notch. And then well, let me just scroll over. So the peak of the second wave will give me my dichronic notch, and the peak of the first wave will give me the end of my diastolic pressure. So I can use these two points to calculate um, the slope of this line here and take its reciprocal to calculate the time decay constant. So using a simple calculation, I'm able to obtain those values. So when you do that and look at the waveform between wild type versus um, the, the uh, column tree mutation, we find that the uh, pulse pressure is increased in these animals, which is an indicator of arterial stiffening. When we look at the augmentation pressure, we find that is also elevated. And overall, that gives us about an 8% increase in the augmentation index, indicating these animals have stiffer arteries. And when we look at the uh, time decay constant, we find that there is slower emptying of the blood vessels um, uh, from the aorta into the blood vessels, sorry. Another um, thing showing that there's an increase in vascular tone in these animals. To validate that, we then looked at using vasopressors like phenylephrine and uh, angiotensin II, phenylephrine being an alpha-1 agonist. 
and we do serial uh, log dosing uh, in the animal. Traditionally, you would use isolated blood vessels in a wire myograph, but if you use these drugs in acute settings, you can infer that most of the response is coming from the vasculature, uh, and you can monitor heart rate to look for any bradycardic effects um, reflexively. And when we look at this data, we find that these animals uh, have an increase in their Emax, um, and so a, a higher response to, to this stimulation. Uh, so this is the primary phenotype driving the, the vasculature here. And when we look at the biochemical markers, we see increase in um, phosphoMYPT1 indicating the myosin actin uh, machinery is, is overactivated. So how would we look at this um, pharmacologically to try to treat it? Well, SPAC has a conserved C terminal. It has these highly conserved residues in, the, in, the, in its C-term, this leucine, which is important for binding to its effector, NCC, and to its regulator, uh, uh, WINC, which use the exact same motifs to bind to this conserved CC domain. So when WINC binds to SPAC, it gets phosphorylated. SPAC then binds to NC, phosphorylates that. So we then want to look at can we just create the Gittleman syndrome phenotype of low blood pressure by preventing binding. So we do this by substituting a leucine for an alanine in a, in a genetic mace model. We hypothesize that this would then um, prevent uh, binding between um, NCC and WINC to SPAC. And our in vitro data shows uh, SPAC against this motif in the NC and WINCs that you get decreased binding. When we do this in the animal models and look at kidney lysates, we find that um, <clears throat> the binding to WINC is decreased. Uh, you don't get an alteration in the actual WINC levels, but you do get a loss of their phospho levels. That loss of phosphorylation then leads to a loss of uh, multiple sites of phosphorylation on NCC, and that ends up not only decreasing activity, but destabilizing the protein as a membrane and promoting its degradation. When you look at the kidney itself, you find that there is not only a reduction in the signal of phospho-NCC in the total NCC, but a reduction in the total uh, volume of, uh, of tubules uh, in the animal, so you get some remodeling phenomena as well. But does this all lead to an actual change in physiological function? So we put animals on a high sodium diet, uh, about 3% uh, weight to weight, uh, and then we swap them to a low sodium diet of 0.03% weight to weight, so a hundred fold difference, and we measure their urinary excretion over a 24 hour window, and um, we quantify the sodium against creatinine um, to compensate for urinary concentration. We look at area under the curve for this, we find that these animals have roughly about a 20-25% difference in their ability to retain sodium, and so therefore they have a salt-wasting phenotype recapitulating Gittleman syndrome. This then leads to a decrease in blood pressure of about 18 millimeters of mercury systolic and about 19 diastolic, and, uh, and it, but it also causes a decrease in heart rate as well. And, and we suspect that this might be due to the effects um, of the wink spac pathway and other um, SLC12A proteins like NKCC1, NKCC2, which are related to NCC. Um, these are present in all tissues uh, along with SPAC. We find that there's a decrease of SPAC uh, phosphorylation in brain, heart, kidney, and testes as kind of a catch-all. There's no change in the total abundance of NKCC1, uh, which imports a sodium and potassium and two chloride into the cell, but there is a loss of its phosphoactivated form. And uh, this would suggest changes in the contractility of the heart and also alterations of sympathetic nerve activity, all of which would potentially affect the vasoconstriction in the animal. So we looked at the pulse wave velocity, uh, uh, pulse wave forms again to try and look at this. There was no difference in pulse pressure, so these animals don't have a stiff artery. And when we look at the augmentation pressure, uh, this is significantly decreased in the SPAC animals. As a result, their augmentation pressures are significantly reduced. I should note here at this point that there is um, no known medications or drugs that will lower arterial stiffening directly. Uh, you can only really do it by modifying blood pressure long term. Looking at diastolic time decay, we find that it is uh, faster uh, emptying in the SPAC and knock in animals, which have Gittleman syndrome, and therefore have less total peripheral resistance. So, in summary, uh, the Cullen 3 phenotype of PHA2E uh, has accumulation of WINCs, which causes overactivation of SPAC leading to increased sodium reabsorption via NCC, and that increases blood pressure. And these animals have a phenotype of arterial stiffening and resistance, which we would also expect to appear in the patients, suggesting that we need to administer vasodilators as well as diuretics to these cases. The SPAC animals have decreased phosphorylation SPAC because they cannot find wink, uh, 
they lose, uh, as a result, there is decreased activity of NPC, causing salt wasting, lowering blood pressure. And these animals also have a phenotype of um, reduced arterial stiffening and uh, peripheral resistance, which is uh, highly advantageous. There are currently several small molecules that have been developed um, targeting winks directly, SPACs directly, their binding domains, and then some of the other flares like uh, MO25, which, which um, can activate SPAC independent of wink. All of these have clinically relevant potencies, uh, which, is, which is quite encouraging. And the preclinical work is showing some good results, which you can see in the right here, which is a vehicle drug versus different doses of a wink um, inhibitor. And you can see in the short acute window that there's a drop off of mean arterial pressure in the 10 milligram per kilogram body weight, as well as an increase in urinary flow um, and diuresis. So in conclusion, um, our discovery of a vascular phenotype um, suggests that we need to improve our treatment of Gordon syndrome patients and that this pathway um, that exists in multiple organ systems controls blood pressures at the renal, um, cardiovascular and um, nervous system level. And that inhibiting SPAC would be a really good um, uh, novel antihypertensive target that would give you effects similar to thiazide but without any of the effects of diabetes and gout. And some of the preliminary data is showing that uh, when you knock out SPAC function, you can increase insulin sensitivity, reduce diet induced obesity, and increase bone mineral density, all side effect profiles, which would be actually beneficial and be useful for treating metabolic syndrome. So, with that, I just want to end by thanking um, the teams in Cambridge where I did this work uh, for my PhD, uh, the collaborators in Dundee, uh, particularly Jinwei Zhan and Francis and Dario Alessi, who helped produce the animals and the biochemical work and then Rene Binville for providing some of the uh, videos and images that you saw at the beginning. And with that, thank you very much, and I'm happy to take any questions. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Keith. Uh, that was really a great presentation. Um, we haven't got any question in the Q&A tab just yet, but please, um, people that are here on the call, if you want to ask anything to Keith about his research, you can pop them in there or you can raise, raise your hand and we will meet you to ask the question directly to Keith. So, um, that would be great. Yeah, also, I, can't, I can't turn on my camera, it just doesn't let me. I'm not trying to hide. <laughs> All right, I understand. Let's see if we can do something about this. Oh, I think it should, there we go. Yeah, there we go. I can see you now. Great. So while people are maybe thinking of their questions, I actually do have a few, Keith, if you don't mind me asking. So we saw a video, uh, a, a screenshot of Lapchab Landing, for which you have been an early adopter. I wanted to ask you if you had any favorite features in this software so far. Yeah, I, I think um, one of the things that I, I quite like is the ability to overlay traces over one another, uh, which I think you saw me doing there, which is useful for the analysis because I can just visualize what I'm doing, but it's also useful for when doing live experiments, ECG over, over blood pressure, and, and to have those in the go. And then, oddly enough, uh, the black background, because I prefer to do my experiments in low lighting with just the spotlight on. So it's kind of nice to have. <laughs> Sounds good. I just thank you. Across the I just want to thank her as well because Paula helped us develop uh, and run all the macros and the troubleshooting when we did this in the first first run. So thanks. I also have another question with regards to the waveforms that you've shown in your presentation. So where were you measuring these waveforms from? Jeremy plotted our tree solid state catheter high frequency sampling and. Um, because it approximates the central blood pressure much better and it's easy to access without kind of going deeper in and uh, risking blood loss. Um, and then, um, yeah, I can. Right. And then also another question I had, uh, just checking if there is no question in the Q&A coming in or uh, participants raising their hands. So, um, is there any other data that could be extracted from the waveforms you've shown in your presentation? Yeah, so so I, I think um, there are areas where you can look at the magnitude of reflectance. So you can do something called pulse waveform separation, 
So you can use mathematical models to disentangle the final interference to get a forward and reverse wave. And you can look at those, and, and those things like the magnitude of actual amplification uh, can, have been shown to be really good predictors of um, not only stiffness, but cardiovascular health, predicting heart failure uh, and organ damage. And it can tell you about whether the vasculature is a primary constriction, changing vascular muscle, or remodeling of the epicenter matrix. And um, there's some of the data you can pull out. Um, and I think I showed one of them was looking at the upstroke of the blood pressure. So normally people would be doing left ventricular measurements directly with the pressure volume loop um, to look at inotropic effects. But you can actually approximate that from a, from a reasonably close vessel to the aorta. The sharp upstroke of the blood pressure, the velocity of it, can be used to infer the inotropy of, of the heart. So that's another bit of information we pull out from. Thank you. Hi, so, hi it's uh, Julien from uh, France. Uh, thanks a lot for the presentation. I have a quick question about the, the signal. Do you also have a look at the uh, pulse transit time uh, to, uh, to, have a, um, to have a recording of the yeah. entire stiffness? So, so um, depending on the site of measurement, you can, you can look at pulse arrival time. So, so we look at the peak of the R wave, and then we use the second derivative of the blood pressure to find the onset of the waveform of blood pressure. And the distance from there to there, you assume the R wave is ejection of blood from the aortic, uh, from the aortic valve, and the time it takes to arrive at your catheter. So assuming yeah. your positioning of the catheter is consistent between the animals, or you do a rough measurement, you can use that to approximate pulse wave, um, pulse wave velocity. Or another way you can do it is if you're, you can do a single uh, measurement of pulse arrival time at one position, and then move your catheter a known distance, and then yeah. do the pulse arrival time again, and use that to calculate pulse wave velocity. Uh, it just tends to introduce more error. Uh, in small animals, it's quite difficult as well. Um, so the gold standard would be to use a, a, a single catheter that has two pressure measurement points. But we have done that in the lab already. So pulse arrival time is something we use. Okay, thanks. Thank you. So before that, I had a question with regards to the drugs that are already existing for uh, anti hypotensive effects. Um, do we, you said that there, there are a few on the market already, um, but why is there a need for another one? Yeah, so I think there, there are many different hypertensive drugs targeting um, calcium channel blockers for uh, your heart, reducing the contractility of the heart, vasodilators like uh, renin-angiotensin inhibitors, for example, diuretics for the kidney to promote and, uh, salt wasting or adrenergic system blockers. Um, but compliance in patients is a big issue. So as somebody has more and more resistance in the hypertension, they go on three or four medications, taking them daily. It can be quite difficult. You also get people who have specific resistance to hypertension. We can't pinpoint where. So an advantage of looking at the wings back pathway is that this is an evolutionarily ancient uh, signaling cascade that dates back to unicellular organisms and was really important in the move from water to land for animals. And it acts in every single organ system that controls blood pressure. And so if you, with a single drug, you could do multi-targeting of blood pressure. And then on top of that, its side effect profile is generally all beneficial. You're getting increased bone mineral density, you're getting a reduction in diet-induced obesity, reducing triglyceride levels, and increasing insulin sensitivity. So it's it's one of those kind of exciting targets where side effects are good things. So that's why we're looking at this as a new one. Thank you. 